discussion group. Um, my name is Joe Williams, and I'm the Interim Associate University Librarian for Collections and Services at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and I'm also the new convener of this discussion group. So thank you all for attending today. I hope the program that we have planned is interesting and relevant for you, and we welcome your feedback on this meeting, as well as suggestions for our next meeting, which will be a face-to-face -face meeting at the ALA Annual Conference in New Orleans, and we will send a meeting date and time and location when those details are set. Um, I'd like to take just a moment to thank and recognize the newly appointed steering group of volunteers that made today's program possible. That is Jeffrey Archer of McGill University, Dennis Clark of University of Virginia, Diane Dallas from University of Chicago, Susan Goodwin of Texas A&M University, Barbara Rockenbach from Columbia University, and Joe Salem from Penn State University. And um, although we are meeting virtually today, our session is programmed just like our usual face-to-face -face meetings, and that is we have selected three discussion topics of interest to the group, and we'll devote up to 30 minutes for a discussion of each topic and each of these three discussions will be kicked off by a very brief presentation from one of our members. So the first topic is data support, and that will be kicked off by Barbara Rockenbach. Um, then the second discussion will be around digital scholarship support. And Diane Dallas was unfortunately unable to attend this afternoon, but I'll be glad to kick off this conversation. And our third topic this afternoon is managing liaison responsibilities. And we have a change in presenters for this kickoff. Dennis Clark of University of Virginia will start the discussion. Um, Joe Salem of Penn State was unfortunately not able to present as planned. So many thanks to Dennis for stepping in. And again, we're approaching this meeting as a true group discussion rather than a, a panel or a Q&A. So I hope everyone attending here will feel comfortable joining in the conversation using your microphone. Um, and when your microphone is not in use, if you would, uh, please mute it up at the, um, with the green microphone icon at the top of your screen. And of course, for those who have no microphones, you're welcome to type your comments to the group through the chat window. And we'll all try to work through those comments as a group as we can. And finally, um, please just be aware that this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be shared on the ALA website following our session today. So with that, I will now turn things over to our colleague, um, Barbara Bachenbach, to talk about data support. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, very, very faintly. Just faintly? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to see if I can turn my microphone up here a little bit. Um, you can hear you. Okay, great. All right. Well, I'm just going to jump in then. Um, thank you all for, for joining this call. Um, as as Joe said, we're just going to kick off with just a few sort of thoughts um, about these topics and then really open it up for discussion. I was interested in, in thinking a little bit more with the group about data support because we in the Columbia Libraries did a reorganization about a year ago which consolidated our data support into one unit, which we call Research Data Services. And, um, I, I think thus far it has gone rather well, and I'll tell you a bit about that unit. But I've got some outstanding questions, and, and hopefully all of you will have some, some thoughts and advice about um, how to integrate those services into the work all of our liaisons are doing, uh, the work of digital scholarship, and, and also some questions about um, kind of partnership opportunities on campus. So, uh, in our reorganization, in our research data services group, we have a head of that group and uh, three people who are working in that capacity. 
One person is a research data coordinator. So that's someone who is devoted solely to thinking about research data. Um, and we're making a distinction here between research data and data for research. So on the research data side, that's all the data that's produced on campus in the process of, of research. And then data for research um, are the, the, the data sets and, um, and assets that are being used to support different research activities, either things that we've licensed, um, things that we've purchased, or things that we've, um, that we've actually produced here in, in support of, of the research process. So um, that unit includes GIS support and um, includes all of so our spatial data and also our numeric data. And so my questions really for the group are, um, how are you all organizing the set of services? Uh, how does that dovetail into kind of some of your digital scholarship work? Here we have a separate digital scholarship unit. And that was very deliberate to separate those two sets of activities, but I'm now beginning to wonder if we could have integrated them more fully. And then finally, I'd love to hear from anyone about who they're finding key campus partners in the area of data support and how that, that's helped you develop your program in alignment with, with your institution. So why don't we maybe start off with anyone who wants to just weigh in on how they're organizing data support uh, within their, their organization. Hello? This is Dennis, I'll jump in. Thank you. Sure, so um, I have the opportunity to look at uh, several things we're doing at the University of Virginia with, with fairly fresh eyes because um, I've only been here for two and a half weeks. So I'm still learning my way around, of course, including areas that I supervise. But uh, we have a a different uh, organization around data support services, and if, if Judy Thomas is also uh, uh, Judy Thomas from UVA is also on, she may have some perspectives as well. But um, we organize uh, data discovery and acquisitions, research data management, um, our research software, and when we actually look at uh, our our data versus data. It's organized under our science and engineering section. There seemed to be a more natural fit here at the University of Virginia to fit in with, uh, with our science and engineering, social sciences, sciences and engineering folks, uh, rather, or, uh, rather than being a kind of standalone, standalone unit. So that, that's, uh, I'm still learning a lot about that. That's the way we do it at UVA today. Uh, but I'm really interested in hearing what other people do as well. So someone else should talk. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So um, this is Mike Meth from Florida State University. Um, we are going through various transitions as we're evolving what uh, data for us looks like. One of the things that we're finding is that if we say data, we're missing sort of the nuances of different pieces of data. So we're trying to break it up into data information liter literacy uh, as one piece. Uh, then we're breaking up another piece of, uh, of the uh, resource data management piece, trying to figure out how we do the support uh, for granting agencies, et cetera, and that deposit. And then the last part is that we're talking about infrastructure um, and, and sort of what we need to figure out in terms of how we can perhaps even house data. And so we're, we're finding that we're having different models that are uh, tapping into the liaison of subject librarians on, on the one hand, um, and then we also have some, uh, I guess, some organization happening through our technology uh, side of the house, um, and through the digital scholarship unit. And so there are these overlaps in the different areas, um, but at the same time, you know, we're we're still working it out as well because the the uh, I guess the whole field keeps on evolving for us, and so. Uh, as the field is evolving around us, as the tools, and we're learning more, and then also, of course, as far as, uh, you know, new folks come in and out of the organization, that's another piece that's influencing uh, how we're organizing around data. 
Mike, that would you mind a little bit more about the data yeah. information literacy? What, what does that entail for you? Uh, <clears throat> that entails for us uh, teaching all of our scholars, so faculty, graduate, undergraduate students, um, what data is and all the the complexities of data, everything from the different formats to the ethics around data, et cetera. And to that end, again, through the, sort of the different uh, branches, we've done it through the STEM libraries, uh, as well as through our uh, social science and uh, libraries, uh, trying to figure out how we can bring that content. And we do it uh, in different formats. So we've actually, uh, last year, ran a 15-week workshop that had sort of an, a weekly theme. Um, and we developed that whole curriculum. But then also we've done the one-off workshops or the smaller on-demand workshops. Does that answer, Barbara, what you're looking for? Or? Absolutely. Um, is, Mike, is that a curriculum you'd be willing to share? Yeah, of course. That, that would be you. Uh, how, would I, how, how would you like me to send it just to you, Barbara, or is there another way? I'm, I guess we're figuring out how this whole group works and shares. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we do have our AUL list that we um, I don't know if you'd be comfortable sharing it with the whole list, but um, there's probably others on the call who'd be interested, I'd imagine. Sure. If nobody minds me spamming the list, I'll be happy to send something out. Excellent. Um, I'm going to just take a minute to read out one of the uh, chats from Pat. Um, where uh, At UNLV, we have a data team made up of liaison librarians and functional specialists, not a separate unit. And then we've got from Catherine at UT Austin, we have a research data services unit with one staff, staff member right now, a data management coordinator and a GIS geospatial coordinator starting this summer. The research data service unit is within SCALCOM. That's interesting. And, it's, and um, our unit does work closely with liaison. Maybe that would be a, a good um, segue to, to talk a little bit more about how people have liaisons um, interfacing with data support. Does anyone want to talk a little about that? This is Susie at Texas A&M. And um, like Florida State, we have a SCALCOM unit that oversees our data support, but we have liaisons who have gotten together to focus more on the data literacy side of things and are promoting workshops to graduate students in particular as a starting point. Great. Anyone else? This is Bana at Cornell. I'm sitting in for Shane Lee, who couldn't be part of the meeting. Um, we've been providing um, very decentralized data services. We have a group that works that bonded together around the grant support, um, primarily for the sciences. In the social sciences um, and business, these are coming out of some of the individual libraries. But we just have hired a social science and geospatial data librarian who will be starting early in May, and we're beginning the conversations about how do we take a more holistic look at data. Otherwise, I mean, we've had workshops, um, a couple of the liaisons to social science departments um, have spent a good bit of time um, working with their departments. And we also have a social science data institute on campus that we have librarians who work with very closely. Great. We just had a couple of new things come into the chat. David, thank you for sending a link out to your very impressive page on um, new data and visualization departments. Um, it actually the, just had a quick glance at it, but it really does enumerate the kinds of services you offer in a very nice graphical way. Um, and it sounds like you're, you're in the process of creating two new physical spaces for data support, which is interesting. Um, and then we have Jeffrey saying, our data libraries and user services work directly with subject liaisons to support patrons and faculty. Um, oh, that's interesting. Okay, it would be interesting to see where the um, NCSU department sits in the organization. We also have a bit of information about UCLA, which has uh, theirs in a user engagement organization. 
in the social science data archive. That's interesting. Great. Does anyone want to talk a little bit about their um, their campus partners, other offices that you found to have been um, helpful in advancing your work? We, over the last several years, worked really closely with our Office of Research um, around some of the issues of, of research data management. Um, but we're certain there are others on campus that we should be working with. Does anyone have any suggestions on that? Okay, I'm hearing from Catherine, um, Office of the Vice President for Research, Office of Sponsored Projects, and the Office of Graduate Studies. Super Computing Center and Campus uh, ITS have also been good partners. And an Institute for Digital Research and Education. That's interesting. Does anyone have any thoughts on how data support dovetails with digital scholarship efforts? This is something that I, you know, as I mentioned, have been thinking a lot about. We find um, our challenges in our digital scholarship unit, uh, that's where our institutional repository is. And having data support outside of digital scholarship has meant some need for close collaboration between those working in research data um, and those who are working with faculty who want to deposit in our repository. It's kind of working across those two units. I'd, I'd be curious to see if anyone has come up with some good ways of bridging those sets of activities. Uh, Mike again. I hope nobody minds. I, I don't mind speaking. Um, we're, I think we're, we're struggling with that a little bit as well, but we recently had our first data deposit, I've heard, into our institutional repository. But the challenge is, you know, what do we store, how do we store it, and all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're trying to work through some of these relationships that we're building with these data information literacy workshops. And then, of course, there are other um, I guess we're trying to figure out the infrastructure, but that's what I mentioned earlier. So can we use something like Amazon Cloud Services or uh, others to help us house and accommodate data? Um, so we're kind of trying to work with the researchers on figuring out whether we are the right place or whether there is a discipline-specific repository. And so it kind of, I think, all dovetails in a way into Skullcom and, and the whole package of advice that we're trying to provide. That makes a lot of sense. Now, I see Judy just wrote in to say we're putting increasing emphasis on support for open data. Um, I'd be curious to know more about that. One thing we've been asked for from our Data Science Institute, which is an interdisciplinary institute that started about four or five years ago here at Columbia, we, there's a new director who arrived and said, how come there's not an aggregated place for discovery of data on campus? She wants to see one kind of point of discovery for all licensed, um, purchased, and created uh, data. And so we're in the process of trying to figure out if our discovery layer on our catalog, we use Blacklight, if that could actually be um, helpful in, in sort of data discovery. And I'm just curious, that would also include open data. And I'm just curious if anyone has tackled this problem of trying to um, aggregate all your data as a kind of a, a discovery point.
So I see some comments in the, the chat more about uh, digital scholarship, um, but also this kind of notion from Neil at Toronto of a virtual front door to services on our website and curriculum and instructional sessions. So again, that kind of an aggregating of at least the services around it looks like data and digital scholarship. Okay, it looks like a number of people are typing now. Um, we're coming up on 325, so I'm going to be mindful of time and let this segue to Joe. But um, it sounds like there's a lot here, and I think we probably could continue this discussion when we all get together um, at annual this year. It just feels like we're all grappling with this, and it affects so many parts of the work we do and the kinds of relationships we have with others on campus. Any other thoughts before we move into the next? Part of our, our discussion? Yes. Okay, here we go. Okay. These have been um, some excellent questions you raised, and thanks to everyone who um, is responding either through chat or um, through your microphones. And if possible, if people can contribute through uh, microphones, I think the, um, the conversation will um, be even richer. Um, any other last questions? Uh, Anyone wants to put out there for the hive mind here? Um, questions either uh, that Barbara raised or, or other things you'd like to put to this group before we move on? Okay. Well, thank you, Barbara. And uh, I know that you may have to leave soon. Uh, Barbara is in the middle of a snowstorm right now, and I think you're closing your library early. So um, yeah. thank you for, for taking the time to, um, to lead this discussion. Absolutely. Thanks, all. I'll be, I'll be in for a few more minutes. I look forward to the next topic. Thanks. OK, great. And um, so I'll uh, do my best here to kick off the, the next topic, which is um, digital scholarship support. And um, uh, I guess my questions around this topic for the group really are, I'm, I'm interested in hearing about models of support um, and your definitions of digital scholarship. And some of this Barbara was kind of touching on in her last question, um, particularly around um, including or not including data support. There, I can say that um, you know at, at UNC Chapel Hill we have a distributed model um, supporting uh, digital scholarship that we're calling the Research Hub Program, and this is I think in its fourth year now. We basically we have three physical locations in three different libraries on campus: uh, the Davis Library, which is the Social Sciences uh, Humanities Library. Um, the Keenan Science Library, which uh, caters to natural sciences, um, and the Health Sciences Library. So within this program, we have some services that are consistent across all three locations, right? Like some type of data support. We provide presentation spaces, and um, we try to keep an active calendar of programs happening in each space uh, related to digital scholarship. Um, we provide working spaces for groups and things like that, but then we we also have some more tailored services um, at each location, kind of targeted to the clientele that we're serving in a particular library. So at Davis Library, um, the research hub in that location is um, supporting primarily geospatial data, text and numeric data. Um, Age of visualization, uh, particularly related to those areas, and, and digital humanities, text mining, things like that. Um, the Health Sciences Library's uh, research hub focuses more on um, things like uh, supporting NEH grant compliance um, and um, exploring digital health devices with researchers and um, 
our research hub in the Keenan Science Library um, has some targeted services, uh, including a maker space, and they're they're really focused on um, kind of helping researchers take ideas um, to market and sort of um, addressing some of the entrepreneurial aspects of um, research. Um, so I'd be I'd be interested to hear um, from others here what you know since. Folks have been supporting digital scholarship now for some time. What what models your um, you've arrived at right now, and what the the pros and cons might be? I will say, um, you know, one of the, the one of the challenges to the distributed model that I was describing here is um, that everything is distributed, and um, so, you know, it, it um, you have to pay uh, a closer attention to um, connecting um, patrons and connecting um, staff across the various locations. Um, so it requires some some extra attention in that way. Um, we also our our digital scholarship support is in a in a program that is separate from our liaison model. So uh, one challenge for us then is um, how do you bring liaisons or how do liaisons bring faculty and other researchers into this research hub environment? Um, and I see maybe some folks are writing comments as well. I'm going to mute my mic for a moment and give someone else a chance to speak. So I'll follow up. Uh, this is Dennis from uh, UVA again. Again, having my fresh eyes perspective, I'm kind of knee deep in some of the issues that. Joe brought up. Digital scholarship at UVA centers around digital humanities, and that goes back to the um, Electronic Tech Center back with Kid and Stubbs, and we're going back to the 80s now, I suppose. And it has evolved into uh, a hub for digital humanities called Scholars Lab. You may, you may have uh, heard it or come across it before. And it is two things. It's both a place for experimentation as well as a place that helps humanities scholars and faculty, but mostly graduate students, evolve and understand um, the digital component of their humanities work. So it has a makerspace. It has uh, the opportunity for that kind of experimental stuff. But it is primarily uh, part and parcel of um, an initiative for learning, really, about digital humanities at, at UVA. I provided a link there if anybody wants to go and check out uh, some of what happens in the Scholars Lab. Thanks, Dennis. At Cornell, we um, have our in a physical maker space up at Mann Library, which is primarily life sciences, and we think more about digital scholarship, digital humanities support, and coding some more the digital side of making in Olin and Uris. Um, we have a collaboration with people in our production units, so we're looking both from the, the product that's needed for digital scholarship, going through the process to take that product and apply digital methodologies to result in scholarship. So we're, I think, trying to you know, sort of look through, some, somehow look through the life cycle of the digital. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. So a, a couple of folks 
here have mentioned either uh, through audio or um, through the comments mentioned maker spaces. Um, one other question that I had uh, for the group was um, around kind of pedagogy around digital scholarship and how you are engaging with faculty and students. Um, we have found in our experience um, there's lots of um, it's a fruitful area to uh, be working with uh, faculty around the making competencies and integrating making into teaching and learning. And uh, I wonder if, if others have comments about um, pedagogy. We've been for several years collaborating with our Society for the Humanities and offering um, summer fellowships for graduate students. It includes a stipend plus um, a six-week program and they will work very closely with people who are working in all aspects of digital scholarship. In addition, we run a number of workshops and co-working groups through the year. Right now we have a newly formed um, large active group of those who are interested in text mining as an example. Great, thank you. See other comments here from folks uh, with other fellowship um, opportunities. Judy Thomas, UVA, working closely with faculty at their Center for Teaching Excellence. Uh, good partnership. Um, the comments about um, fellowships and those types of programs also um, brings another question to my mind, which is um, kind of re related to digital scholarship and if you've found successful ways to tie um, library development to uh, digital scholarship and kind of the stories that, that come out of these services and spaces. Like several folks are talking about recent reorganizations or uh, plans for new or updated scholarship labs. Um, no takers on the pedagogy questions. I take it. Uh, okay, thanks, David. And CSU has had some success raising money to support making programs. Mm -hmm. You know, another um, question I had for the group, and, and please, if other folks have, have questions that you want to put to the, the whole group, please speak up and do so. But another um, question I had in mind was um, related to kind of digital collections, um, the projects and exhibits and um, the collections that um, our staff are, are helping researchers create through our scholarship, um, digital scholarship support programs. I'm wondering how folks are uh, approaching those projects with researchers, if they are, um, you know, we, we have um, a, a charter that we're using that sets out some different sort of tiers of um, project type and sort of the expectations on both the researcher and the library's uh, behalf on, on um, what kind of support these different types of projects require. And um, I wonder how others here might be helping researchers set the scope and set expectations for um, creating digital collections, exhibits, um, things like that.
Hello, this is Jeffrey at McGill, and I, I guess I'm wondering how you want to differentiate um, something that we've created from, say, special collections and other kinds of materials versus things that we're acquiring with essential, essentially text mining rights, um, and also how are people approaching faculty as they are wanting to share things that they're they've been working with, but we our licenses don't allow that kind of sharing. We actually had a, um, a text mining faculty member um, put up data that he used for the article that he had written, and it was actually MLA data that, from ProQuest. It, although it was metadata, it violated our contract, and we actually had to show him our contract, and he actually ended up having to retract his, his data set from a repository. Great question. Thanks, Jeffrey. Do we have any um, takers? Well, um, are there other questions from the group? I don't want to uh, force a conversation if there's not one to have here. Any other uh, questions related to digital scholarship support before we um, move on to managing yeah. uh, liaisons? Uh, this is Stephen Bell. Yes, go for I it. I just asked a question, and uh, some of you may have seen this uh, the beta or the discussion of it at ALA, this was Gale Digital Scholars Lab, and it's a tool that uh, they're uh, putting together that would basically take a lot of the very sophisticated tech tools that people in our Digital Scholarship Center work with, like text mining tools, and make these fairly, well, less rigorous to learn and to use. Like, for example, someone who's working on the project said, you know, something that might take weeks to do can can take an hour. Now, I talked to our Digital Scholarship Center director about this, and he said, well, if you're a faculty or a graduate level, you really want to learn how these tools, the, the native tools work. You want to invest time in learning them, but clearly undergrads might not have that time. And I think the other challenge we are facing is some of our liaison librarians would like to be more engaged in the Digital Scholarship Center, but the work, but the projects are at such a high level that you just, if, unless you really learn all the tools, you just can't jump in. So I don't know if any others were uh, thinking about that, both as a way to get more undergrad projects going and as a way to have liaisons working with undergrads on Digital Scholarship projects. Because right now at our Digital Scholarship Center, undergrads are pretty much not not able to do a lot there other than come to some of the workshops that they offer like there's a, a a workshop on how to use arduinos you could do that but not much beyond that this is dennis from uva i think i think stephen raises some really interesting questions about how and this goes back to the question i guess you had earlier joe about pedagogy around around digital scholarship um, our, our, our scholars lab at UVA is focused very much on, on graduate students and faculty, and we don't really have uh, an analog for the undergraduate learner. Uh, so like Stephen was saying, we, can, we, we certainly have some opportunity for people to come in and do workshops or come into the space, but for the most part there is this uh, expectation that the folks who are using Scholars Lab are digital humanities scholars that are that are at a level already. Uh, maybe they're not all that uh, advanced with their technology, but their scholarship is pretty far along. They're, they already know what they're doing. So that's just the next step. So um, trying to find those opportunities to connect that for us 
with the undergraduate experience and the, the new learner who needs a safe space that they can go, a safe and, and ethical space they can go to, uh, and the equipment they can use, an opportunity for them to be involved is really important to me. Uh, so I'm really interested in seeing how others do that as well. That's great. Okay, thanks. Not hearing too many folks saying you're looking at it, but uh, again, it's still pretty early in the game, so maybe we just need to see how this thing involves. I don't know if anybody was doing the beta. Okay, thank you, Stephen and Dennis. Um, any other any other questions? Did I miss anything through the chat box? It looks like John Hopkins is doing the beta. Okay, great. Thank you, Margaret. And David from NCSU says they've had some success negotiating text mining rights in some data sets. Still early days. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Margaret. Yes, please do keep us posted on what you think of the beta. <clears throat> um, okay, thanks, folks. Well, um, I think we can go ahead and move on to our, um, our last topic for the afternoon to discuss. And this does kind of um, lead in naturally, particularly from uh, Dennis's comments before about um, investing time in learning new tools. Um, and this uh, final topic is uh, talking about managing liaison responsibilities. So Dennis, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. Um, so like I said before, this is only my, my third week at UVA. So I'm, I'm learning a lot and, uh, and trying to uh, get my head around um, lots of things. And you know, one of those things is absolutely this question of managing liaison responsibilities and really understanding what liaisons both do and what they should be doing. Um, so Joe and Barbara have already talked a little bit about some of those areas that all of our liaisons are engaged with uh, you know, the digital scholarship, data curation, data management, data services. So um, I want to give just kind of the, the briefest overview in my thinking about how we should be thinking about liaison or opportunities we have to think about liaison expectations and, uh, and understand how you think about them at your institutions. It occurred to me that we we're about five years uh, out from um, the new roles for New Times publication. I guess that's Karen Williams when she was in Minnesota. Um, I don't remember, but it, it was a 2013 ARL publication called New Roles for New Times, which kind of set out really uh, um, one of ARL's first kind of shots to this idea of evolving liaisons away from, or acknowledging the evolution from collection and library centric into kind of an engagement centered librarianship and liaisonship. Uh, and what's obvious from today, both from our questions and from our uh, what, what Joe has talked about, what Barbara brought forward uh, and others, is that we're still evolving. Um, the breadth of what our liaisons do uh, is, is increasing. Uh, the numbers of liaisons we have, I think for many of us, is decreasing as other, as other resources are, are needed and elsewhere. Um, and, and real quick, that Barbara wrote, um, as part of her working with the Cornell uh, Columbia pilot, uh, Barbara and others wrote an article that was published in CRL News a couple of years ago. It was it talked a lot about reskilling our liaisons or encouraging them to continue to be skilled in a way that makes them increasingly relevant for uh, for our institutions. But that article noted that three of the major themes from liaisons were one, an abandonment of core duties, two, work overload, and three, miscommunication. So obviously we have a long way to go before we really understand what the model of liaisons, quote unquote, should be doing. Um, 
So I've got a couple of questions I'd like to throw out there, both in terms of my fresh eyes here at UVA, but also you know to kind of understand what's what's going on um, elsewhere. Um, what have your liaisons stopped doing or reduced doing in order to meet the demands of their evolving roles? Uh, at UVA, we haven't had librarians or liaison librarians, subject librarians on a desk, a major you know, service desk for, for a number of years. Um, you know, but sometimes they want to be on the desk. They want to be able to volunteer. So what do you see at your institution and how do you manage scope creep? So I'll just leave that out there. Or maybe you don't. Maybe maybe the challenge is, is doing everything with an increasingly finite amount of time for your li liaisons. Uh, Dennis, uh, this is Joe. Um, I mean, a couple of things that come to mind for me are uh, so so desk uh, desk service is is um, one thing that we're still um, moving liaisons um, liaisons are stepping back from that in order to free up more time. Um, we're transitioning to a, a single service point um, here in Davis Library, um, so that's one area. Um, I guess, you know, uh, selector duties, um, we've certainly been trying to reduce the, the burden of um, selection for our liaisons wherever we can by automating um, processes and um, through um, more data-driven programs, DDAs and things like that. Um, so just two quick questions. Yeah, and Stephen um, Stephen said was talking about um, the the balance between high impact practices and low impact practices, and I wonder how uh, how you uh, Joe you or others um, deal with that question of trying to move folks away from potentially low impact practices, but ones that many of us uh, kind of thrive on or are uh, maybe symbolic parts of our our, our duties as, uh, as liaisons. Does anybody have any insights on moving away from those low impact practices? I don't know if it's moving away, but it's, I mean, this is Jeffrey at McGill, but the idea of becoming more effective in some areas so that I have some liaisons who are teaching 30 d information literacy courses to 20 different classes within a single department. So for me, that's actually not very strategic. They would, again, I've only been here for a year, but the idea of doing curriculum mapping so that they only hit the targeted areas where it makes sense. And that would free up time. So I, I think there are ways that you can, we can be more effective in even how they're approaching some of those traditional roles of instruction, for example. Susie here at Texas A&M, and I would echo what Joe said earlier about, you know, what can we stop doing? So our librarians are doing less time on the ref desk, although they really want to stay connected. But one thing we're doing here, and I think it's just naturally evolving, is I see it like an apprenticeship program where we have several new librarians in our SCALCOM unit who really have depth of knowledge in their areas, but they don't know the departments on campus. So they've been partnering with our subject librarians and taking them with them to have conversations about various programs that we have in the library. One big thing we're doing right now is trying to get faculty to flip their textbooks to open access products. And so people seem to be finding their niche and picking sort of project-based things to get involved in that are high impact. And I think that will push them slowly over time away from some of these things that everyone still feels they have to do, but really they don't need to do. 
Thanks, Susie. That that's a great uh, that's a great uh, point. Is to talk about the uh, continuing evolution of what we may or may not be doing in terms of supporting uh, open educational resources, uh, open access textbooks, whatever that might be or be branded in in your institutions. Um, we're still in the in the early stages of that at UVA of of driving uh, OER home. Uh, other institutions in in Virginia are dealing with it more aggressively, uh, particularly our community college system. So what, uh, what OER responsibilities are, are being um, dispersed out there? What are, what are you doing to support OER or open textbooks at, at your campuses? Well, we're, we're doing a lot at Temple. I mean, we've had a very active affordable learning textbook textbook affordability project for quite a few years, but one thing, it can be hard to get liaisons involved in those kind of things. Some feel less qualified to talk to faculty about textbook issues if you haven't. We've done a workshop for our librarians on how to talk to faculty about textbook affordability and OER, uh, but one of the things we're doing to help build a little more confidence is we're doing a textbook listening tour that we started uh, back in the fall and it's continuing into the spring and it's really just going out and having a very wide open conversation with the department head, department chair, any faculty that want to come. Uh, we're not there to sell them on OER, we're not there to tell them why they should use OER, we're only there to say tell us about how you find textbooks to use, why do you pick textbooks. They're just very open-ended questions that can get a conversation going and we always uh, have the liaison to that department go with. And so far, they've been uh, finding that uh, a good practice and that it's giving them insight into the textbook situation in their departments and why some people don't adopt OER and what they might be able to do. So I'll just uh, leave that there. But yeah, that, that was part of the challenge. We had stuff going on, but how do you get the uh, liaisons involved? So we're, we're giving this a shot. Thanks, Stephen. That's terrific. Does anybody have a different level of success at getting liaisons involved with working through some of those OER questions on your campuses? So, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, Dennis. Yeah, this is Joe again. I was uh, going to mention this is kind of um, still early, but uh, uh, within the UNC system, several of the UNC libraries have pooled together um, and received some uh, funding from the from the system to um, explore open o OERs and open textbooks. Um, I can I'll put a link into the chat box here, but uh, basically we've got um, sort of a train the trainer. A program going where uh, faculty and um, librarians are are attending some workshops. Um, faculty and librarians from different uh, campuses within the UNC system um, are all getting kind of the same exposure and training, and then going back to their campuses, recreating these workshops for their um, home institutions um, to try to raise some awareness and. Um, uh, as I said, that's still relatively new, but I'll put the I'll put the link in the chat box. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you. I like I said in the chat. Uh, I really do like the systems level thinking. Those of us who are in um, state systems or or consortia even, um, you know, may want to continue to think about that. I think that's that's the best way uh, to go about making sure that people have a safe space to learn. Uh, and to practice before they're they are kind of hoisted out on their on their um, institutions. I want to go back because uh, Leslie and, and Catherine both had some comments in the chat box a bit ago about trying to uh, focus liaisons work. Uh, and Catherine, in particular, uh, at University of Texas, was talking about liaisons doing more or teaching more, so other liaisons can do more projects. So I suppose what you're saying, Catherine, is that there's you're trying to balance out other bit, um, both expectations as well as preferences in terms of where liaisons are developing their time. So I'll leave that question. And Leslie talks 
a little bit about evolving liaison roles in terms of consolidating service points and having uh, more emphasis at point of service, it sounds like, at paraprofessionals. So I know that's something that lots of folks have, have talked about and have done as well, of course. Yes, yeah, thank you, Catherine, some preferences. Uh, I'd like to go into the question because I don't want to take up uh, more time than, than I'm allotted. Um, and this goes back to this idea that Leslie threw out about uh, having paraprofessionals kind of pick up a bit more of the uh, frontline services. So how does, at your institution, how does that, uh, if I use the, 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 the term triage, how does that triage work? How do uh, questions that need to get promoted or, or elevated to the level of the subject expert or the liaison get that way when our patrons may come in our front door, be it the physical front door or our chat service or a tech service? How, how do you manage that workflow? I think that's really important for liaisons. And I know it's always a tricky spot because there's so many opportunities for the, for the workflow of referral to be um, to be misguided or misdirected at some point during it. So if you've got a good model, I'd love to hear more. I think I, a model I wish I had here at McGill would, would be to, like many of my former uh, colleagues back in the States, the, I, the idea of having so many of your library school students essentially running service points or working at service points, and that's just not the culture or model here at McGill. I see that that as being a, a perfect training ground for the next the next librarians, as well as uh, just an effective service. Yeah, I've always I've always been jealous of uh, of like UNC in Illinois for that because I know they make really good use of their uh, library school students. I will. Uh, yeah, this is Joe again. I will say thank you, Dennis, for saying that. I, you know, the the, the downside of that kind of service model is everybody knows, I think, is the um, incredible amounts of uh, training, um, staff time of spent training students um, and students which cycle through our workforce, you know, yeah. routinely. Um, in some ways, it, it makes me feel like we're just um, kind of trading our liaison's work, one, one form of desk work for another um, in terms of desk service versus training others for the service. That's interesting. I never thought about it from that perspective, but I can see it. So uh, yeah, this is Neil from to know. If, oh, I'm sorry. I, can I just Neil real quick? I'd, I'd be curious to hear if others have moved to um, some type of support model that um, really does not rely on student support, but is more um, uh, staff by professionals, paraprofessionals. Joe, I'll jump into that last question real quick, uh, and and but but quickly, and let others talk as well. Um, at when I was at a, at a, at, um, a different institution at, at VCU, we moved to a model where we were only we did not have students on our public services points because the quality of service they were able to provide was not a good use of our time to train them and their time to invest in, in doing that level of training. So we moved to a staff, uh, frontline staff, and we never use students on the front line. Now, uh, that, that's a different model and a different institution than I am now, but I just wanted to throw that out there. I know there are others who have done the same thing. That's great. Thanks, Dennis. I'm going to catch up with you privately. Uh, so this is Neil from Toronto. I just wanted to add one other kind of um, thought about having uh, grad students or high school students on the desk. Which so here at University of Toronto, at our main science uh, health sciences library, we moved to a, a single desk model several years back, and 
although we, we do have to, you know, train students again and again, um, it does provide an opportunity for some of our liaisons who are looking for a sort of coaching management uh, experience and for whom we don't have other ways to give them that. Um, we sort of ro 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 rotate that responsibility, you know, from year to year, from person to person. And so it does kind of create a nice op opportunity there to uh, have them get a little bit of management experience. Thanks, Gail. That's like a really good point. I wonder, uh, to go just a little bit granular for a second um, in responding to what Leslie was writing in the chat box, she mentioned that uh, they, there's still um, an opportunity for, for too much lag time between a chat system uh, and also a, a robust referral system. Um, one of the things that, that we've done in other institutions that I've worked at is we've moved away from referrals at our desks, as in we don't actually give the patron, for instance, the card of the librarian or the, the, uh, you know, the website that you can go to to make an appointment. We actually moved to a model where we were scheduling appointments for those librarians based on calendar availability while we sat there with the patron, which um, I found does take a lot of the onus out of the patron for having to go back another time and try to find help an additional time. So I was wondering if anybody else uh, did di basically direct appointments uh, at the point of need so the, 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 the patron or the user uh, was immediately connected in a real structured way to that liaison. We've used uh, both Google Calendar and LiveCal to be able to make those those arrangements so those calendars are open for the service desk staff or even the chat staff to be able to make the appointment. Thanks, Stephen. Hearing not much more on that, uh, I'd like to move to one last um, kind of prompt. Um, and this is more complicated. The question is, and I appreciate, by the way, Joe Williams, who, who helped me uh, brainstorm some of these questions out in my, in my short time here. So I'd like to ask about impact. The impact of liaisonship is always complicated. Um, and I have not found a really good model myself so I'm hoping that somebody out there can tell me what the perfect model is for demonstrating liaison services impact. So I'll just sit back and listen. <laughs> More like a desperation question. At some point in the next year, my dean is going to ask me for a, to prove impact of liaisonship and why do we have so many or why do we need so many more? So I'm ready. Just hit me. Yeah, Catherine makes a really good point about the narrative. 
Yes, and I, I'm not, uh, well, maybe I am avoiding your question, but kind of to, to Catherine's point here too, if other folks have ideas about or can share good models for kind of how to capture those stories and um, share them uh, with everyone kind of organizationally who needs to see or hear them, uh, would look. I would love to hear some some great ideas on that as well as uh, for D Dennis's um, impact question. Absolutely. Actually, there was a good program at Midwinter in Denver. I think there were three or four university librarians, and it was the things that they had learned in their long in the, the last few years of their recent work. And part of it was how to get the right stories to them so as they're working with campus administrators to demonstrate that impact because they don't have their hands on that, those kinds of stories. And I think that's the bigger key, because I don't see that uh, developing a real solid rubric for measuring the impact at this point. And if there isn't a rubric, then how, how, what, how can you facilitate getting those stories or getting those examples and packaging them in a way that helps get the university librarian or the dean of the library to actually convey that when they're meeting with the campus administration? Great. Any thoughts on that? Margaret says maybe a Google Doc can record the story of the week to be shared. I like the idea. And how receptive you know, is your dean or university librarian or whomever else are your stakeholders or need to hear the data? How often do they get that? Uh, what, what opportunity do you have to make that, make that point? Well, as, as I'm currently reading about 55 annual performance reviews uh, oh. and the, the other associate deans and the dean will be reviewing them together. I mean, it's it's only at that point, but I think if it's if there are specific areas that you'd like to I mean, at your campus, the idea if there are impact areas that you are wanting more information, whether it's the teaching, whether it's helping people with OERs or it's digital scholarship, I think it's it's trying to pick your areas and then having your liaisons feed and feed those stories or those examples of how a curriculum has changed or how They've implemented um, OERs with the library's help. And maybe it goes back um, to that idea of, you know, the, the library, if you, if you buy into the notion that the, the library's strategic plan ultimately is really the university's strategic plan, and the library's strategic plan is, is really just an implementation uh, department level implementation of that. I guess with this idea of, of being able to choose what data or what narratives you share, you know, circling back to what makes the university tick is probably going to have the most success. And I guess that's different for every one of us in different environments. Yeah. 
I mean, for me in the in the area, it's uh, there's now a bleeding over of uh, knowledge synthesis slash systematic review support, not only in the health sciences, but it's moving over into some of the social sciences. And if you're at a research institution, then where research and publication is is key, showing the librarian's involvement in all of those makes a big difference. Yeah, Jeff Jeffrey's Jeffrey's right on with that. Absolutely. Um, Judy Thomas is, is just from right across campus for me, uh, is saying that uh, she's heard a lot about the idea of liaison as partner rather than a service provider. And that's an argument I completely buy into 100%. So um, maybe that could be our last, I've gone, uh, my little segment's gone about half an hour. So uh, be very willing to, to, to wind it down and consider continuing this and other discussions during the, the meeting in, in New Orleans. But maybe to Judy's point, if anybody has perspective on that, uh, the idea of, of how you've evolved your liaisons into partners rather than service providers, uh, that'd be a great opportunity for stories. I, you've left us speechless. Terrific. Uh, if, that's, if that's the case, that uh, I'll I'll turn it back over to, to Joe to see if he wants to say something uh, on the way out. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Dennis. And um, thank you uh, to all the presenters and all the attendees here who um, participated today. Um, again, the recording will be made available soon. Um, of this session. Um, and also meeting information for our ALA annual in New Orleans will be sent soon as well. And again, that will be a face-to-face -face meeting of this group in New Orleans. Um, next month, we will query this group for discussion topics and for volunteers to lead those kickoff discussions at the annual meeting. So please do be thinking about those. I think, as, as Dennis just said, we may have uh, surfaced several questions here that we want to revisit um, during annual, um, but we will be uh, putting out a query for um, suggested topics. However, um, if you have some suggestions right now, uh, we can certainly jot those down. You can either um, turn on your mic and share those with us or um, type them into the chat box either way. Um, I will say finally, if you if you have any feedback on this program or this format, um, at least in my experience with the group, this is the first time that we have met virtually. Um, so if you have feedback about this program, how uh, how it was conducted, how we could do a better job, uh, please feel free to send that information directly to me. And uh, if there are no final questions, then. I'll just say thank you once again. Any last questions? Thanks, Susie. <laughs> Super. Well, um, thank you all for attending, and I uh, hope to see many of you in New Orleans this summer. Thanks, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>